This movie begins with tides rumbling like clouds, thunder echoing across the sky, and an unknown object emerging from the depth of the sea near a shore. Some may see this as nothing but an old relic that was lying peacefully in the sea and was disturbed by the turbulence in the wind and sea, while others may view this as a sign from the Lord due to its cross-like nature. In prison, a seemingly elderly man, Ray Childress, shares a table with a young lad, Dovey. Dovey wonders why Ray loaded his coffee with more aspirin. Ray is an old man, and it's only safe to conclude that his back aches. Ray pulls out a cupcake, puts on it something that looks like molded weed, pushes it towards Dovey, and says, Happy birthday. It's not Dovey's birthday until March. Ray explains that the day you leave this hellhole is your birthday. Ray asks Dovey to make a wish, contradicting a conversation they had a while ago, in which Ray said, Only children make wishes. Men have given up. Dovey signs out of that hellhole, but the looks on his face don't particularly say he's happy to leave or sad. While exiting the prison, he remembers that Ray told him about his daughter. Ray doesn't believe in miracles, but somehow when the unknown object emerged from the sea, his daughter was in the picture that was published in the newspaper. It's been over seven years since he last spoke to his daughter. She's somewhere in Virginia. Dovey has got him a favor to do. The bus takes Dovey straight into the city, at the bar where the bus stops. The waiter informs Dovey that the warden owns the bar and the check shop right outside. That's why the $27 check he got could only cash him $21 because the warden charges $6 as a commission. The waiter picks interest in Dovey as he alerts her that some hoodlums playing pool will soon flare up the place with a fight. The waiter puts a stop to the fight before it begins by threatening them. She offers Dovey a drink, saying she'll cover for the bill. After closing hours, she tries to get lovey Dovey with Dovey. She begins to finesse Dovey on a couch by the collar, pulling his hands around her body and fixing it on her neck. Dovey was wrongly charged with assassination, so you could imagine how triggering it felt for him when she put his hand on her neck and asked him to show her how he did it. Like a light switch flipped in his head, Dovey comes back from wherever La La Land his mind had flown to. Dovey isn't settled with her want got him to drill the living daylight out of her. If there was a horror movie, Dovey would have been dragged out of the room while he would be screaming for help because he didn't understand why he stood up, went to the door, and couldn't unlock a simple door with the key in the keyhole. The waiter walks up and opens the door for him in disappointment. He walks his way home. He can't hitch a ride because this zone is a hitch, a ride-free zone. The next morning, he goes fishing with his father, who had forgotten how it felt whenever Dovey dives into the water and stays in there like a turtle for a long while. His father opts to pull up this last draw for the day as he hands Dovey a bottle of beer. Pops pulls that haul out of the water with every ounce of strength in his body. He declares that this last haul would be used to feast tonight, even though Dovey feels it'll be better to sell them off for some money. It must have been a wonderful night with a seafood meal. Dovey wakes up from a bad dream of a man being beaten up mercilessly in the bathroom, as he walks in and Ray telling him to look away, so he doesn't become an eyewitness to the event. Pops walks in and greets them, handing him an oversized jacket. The trimmed off materials from that jacket could sew me another full jacket. His patrol officer, Bonnie Bell, a name that rings the wicked soul bell, tries to torment him out of his father's house, but he counters with laws that justify his stay with his dad. She tells him not to step out of the city and to always pick up her calls whenever she puts them through. She scares him right into his pants. He doesn't waste any time telling Ray about this recent development of his confinement to the city of Virginia. Ray assures him that she's just tormenting him, making it feel like if he farts at the wrong time and the wrong place. He'll be back in prison before he can smell it. Ray breaks the pot and tells Dovey that the pain in his back is a cancer on his spine and it's spreading like wildfire. There's only so much time he has. Dovey has to get through to his daughter before it's too late. He just wants to know if she's fine and happy. Ray puts down the phone, and the baddie behind him teases him about missing Dovey. Ray backlashes him, saying that the baddie misses the smell of his sister's penicha. Baldy puts down the phone. The guard's face looks like he's about to poop himself. The guard pulls Ray out of there and locks the gate because he knows blood would spill, and so would his too. Dovey packs his bags in preparation to break Bonnie Bell's rule to not cross the borders. His father walks in and tries to convince him to put his head down and work. Dovey says he knows a guy who in and made a promise that he's gotta keep. Pops gives him some money and says, Don't run out of gas, son. Bro pulls out a mad bike, mounts it, and drives out of the Gotham City like Ghost Rider. Morning in the prison before the walls would experience the sunlight. A prisoner pays a guard, walks right through the hallway gate, and straight to Ray's door. Ray is counting, and said it was meditative. Ray calls him ease, 
and Ease asks what conspired between the Baldi, Cheech, and Ray. Ray says he just ran his mouth aimlessly. From their conversation, there's a plan on the ground to give Ease a name in this prison kingdom. Ease is ready to cut himself out of the plan, but Ray quickly reminds him that everyone has their tags. He is tagged as a washed-off old professor, while Cheech is seen as the king. Ray reassures him that his plan is the way to get him into a spot in this concrete kingdom. Ease warns him not to go about slandering people's families. All in a bid to help a friend, Dovey sleeps at the riverside. He woke up and drove into the city. He goes into a restaurant and is offered freshly brewed coffee. Dovey is lost in her cross eyes for a moment there before he orders a cup of coffee black. He uses this opportunity to ask about Ray's daughter. He pulls out the piece of the newspaper that Ray had given him and asks the waiter if she knows Mariana, daughter of Ray. She doesn't know, so she asks a few old men who were taking their leave. One says her name is Eve and owns a bookstore called White Whale. Dovey immediately climbs on his bike and rides all the way to the White Whale. He walks into the bookstore, and after a few seconds, he don't see anyone. Later, he hears the sound of a kid who is playing with her toys. Dovey pulls closer and gets hit by a flying turtle attack that the girl sent at him. He says he didn't know turtles could fly, and she replies that if they could, then he'd be deceased by now. The melanin goddess expresses her sore distaste for beach novels and mentions that the owner of the place loves these books and loves it when new books come out because it doubles their sales. Right now as they speak, she's out marketing by giving tours in the lighthouse that's just up ahead. The melanin goddess asks if he's here for anything special. He says he's just browsing. He said a friend sent him by. The melanin goddess told him to look around and thank his friends because they don't usually get corners. Dovey zooms to the lighthouse and waits for Eve and her class while munching a burger. The teacher and the student commence their class, and Dovey uses this opportunity to slip into the class from behind. He listens to the mystery of the unknown object in the sea, which seemingly is truly a mystery. And why exactly has this thing gone two three days with the government sending people to check it out? What if it was a UFO that landed in the sea and washed close to the shore? After the tour, everyone comes down the lighthouse, and Dovey stops Eve. He tells her that he enjoyed her speech, and also the mystery of this unknown object has piqued his interest too. He says he loves those kinds of things. She offers to take him to see the unknown object. They walk by some bushes that bruise Dovey a little. They get close enough to the unknown object, but Eve is not contented with the distance they'd covered, so she decides to move a little closer. They sit on the rocks at the shore. She shares her thoughts about what she feels would be down there when they finally move in to check. She speculates that it's a ship that has been resting in silence for a very long time. It emerged due to the disturbance in the air and the high tides of the sea caused by a storm. She says they should scram from here before the tides overtake the rocks. In the process she loses her bangle made out of beads. She mentioned it was from her dad. She turns around and says they should press forward. But love struck Aquaman decides to jump into the river to retrieve the bead bangle. After jumping a few stones, Eve realizes and is shocked. The sad way I was that he's dived into the water for a bead bangle. She thanks him for retrieving her bangle. He's preparing to return back home. His two days have exhausted and the time. She offers him information about a restaurant up south that serves wonderful Tabasco hushpuppy. Dovey calls Ray and informs him about the recent developments. He's conflicted about whether to tell her about Ray or not. Ray feels the reason that she's happy is because she has put him far at the back of her mind and memories. Dovey tells him about the incident of the bracelet and the look on her face when she thought she had lost it. Ray dismisses Dovey, saying he has done more than enough. Remember Dovey was supposed to go home tonight? Well, he didn't. He goes to the restaurant that Eve told him. While they dance, talk, and get mushy all night, they didn't know what was happening in the prison. Ray's plan to put ease on the list of important people was to fake assassinate Ray. On a cool evening like this, while everyone was returning to their rooms, Ease comes out of nowhere and stabs Ray a couple of times with a little nail joined with wood to make it look like a knife. A prison guard does find out that it was a little nail, but Ray is already in the ambulance and is being taken away. Ray awakens like a Greek god and sprays something on the medic next to him, picks up the gun of the police officer, pounds his face with it, pulls the driver to the back, and asks how fast the ambulance was going. He isn't satisfied with the speed, so first of all, he shoots the young policeman around his stomach. And then he highlights the ambulance bust. Dovey and Eve are walking on a porch like two love-struck birds, hands touch, and they both simultaneously stop and look at each other. One step after the other, they both land in a boat that Eve says she's commandeered. As soon as the door is shut, they start kissing. The beer bottles that they were holding have disappeared, lips dancing in a symphony of heartbeats, 
Eyes locked with smiles as bright as the sun and love as hot as the sun is made in the middle of night. The next morning, Bonnie Bell visits Dovey's pop, but Dovey is not there. She threatens that if he doesn't pick her calls or calls back, she's going to have his butt dragged all the way back into that hellhole. Dovey wakes up in the boat and goes outside. Eve, who had already woken up a while ago, freshened up and changed, offers him coffee. They take the boat out for a cruise, and while she sails he asks her about the bracelet. Her dad gave it to her on her 16th birthday. Apparently, Ray, according to her story, wasn't the strongest man in the block, and had a wheelchair for a while before he finally disappeared. This information flustered all over Dovey because the man he knew could carry himself. Ray walks into someone's compound and uses the hose outside to wash off the blood on him. The old lady that lives there comes out to check what is going on in her yard. Ray lies to the woman that he was a paramedic who was looking for a runaway kid and got lost in the woods. The old lady lets him in and gives him some coffee. Later on, he goes in to use the convenience, finds a shaving stick, and shaves off his beard. He then handcuffs the woman to a chair takes the car into her compound, and puts the key in her mailbox. Ray calls Dovey to give him the good news. Dovey lies that he is already back home with his father, and is going to see his parole officer soon. Immediately he drops the call. He goes to White Whale to meet Eve. He walks in behind her and calls her by her real name, Marina. She is shocked to the bone, but in a few seconds, she knows who had told him that name. She comments on the fact that he has no friends in the real world. She runs out through the back door and Dovey follows suit screaming her name. She tells him that if he calls her that again, she'll call the sheriff. She wonders where Ray saw her and knew her whereabouts. It isn't up to a second before she realizes it was from the newspaper. She asks what Ray wants and Dovey replies. He just wants to see you happy. He tells her what's up. She tells him that Ray doesn't have a daughter, but what he does have is a vendetta. The little girl from the first time that Dovey came visiting runs out screaming mommy. She takes the girl in and asks where that bloodthirsty Ray is. Dovey said he's on the state lines. She determines that it'll take him a few hours to get here. Broski asks why Ray is so hell-bent on seeing her if truly, he's not her father. She plainly said he's coming to assassinate her. On the other hand, Ray charts a boat that will take him directly to the lighthouse and the question boils in my head. Who did Ray love so much that was assassinated and also, who assassinated the person? Marina, or a relative of Marina? Ray sails the boat through an eerie swamp. He already assassinated the sailor. With the hoodie he's putting on, I reckon he is ready for any judgment thrown at him, even if it's demised. Someone's coming after you. Aren't you supposed to call the cops and further your distance from the person? These two lovebirds fly around their nest. The lighthouse. Even if they're packing to run. Shouldn't the packing be light? Even lightens Dovey that Ray thrives on emotional debt. Dovey tries to explain that he was just doing this for a friend who helped him out in jail. From the way Eve speaks you would know that there are a lot of truths to uncover. The lighthouse towers high enough to see the entrance routes to this part of town. They decide to let Dovey watch the entrances while she moves about packing her things. Ray sees through their plan as he decides to dock the boat somewhere and use his feet into the city. Eve runs to her child, but instead of her to pack her things immediately, she slouches around until eventually, Harper, Eve's daughter, goes outside under the drizzle to pick up her toys. As she bends down and pulls her head back up, we could see you know whose reflection in a puddle of mud. The child's gone. Eve runs to the lighthouse to inform Dovey that the child is missing. Dovey doesn't mind going back to jail, so he opts that they inform the cops, but she denies it. And more truth is uncovered. The first truth is that he is not her father and wants to assassinate her. Second, she was the one that put him behind bars, and now she's saying he doesn't want to assassinate her. He wants something that he wants. Dovey still insists that they call the cops. And she still denies saying whatever Ray wants. The cops want it too. Before the child was taken, she went into her room and opened the cupboard that was blocked with bricks. She pulled out two bricks in the middle and took out a red cloth. She opened it up and took the cash in it. Some items that looked like accident relics that anime characters would love to get their hands on were also in the cloth. Ray takes the young girl to a boathouse around the corner. He brings her some food, asks her a few questions, and saves the best question for last how old she is. He also shows her a picture of him and Eve that probably eases the little girl's mind. Back to the dumb lovebirds. They're back in the house. Eve knows this revenge thirsty bloodsucker didn't come for her daughter. Unless, I'm beginning to speculate that, she's his daughter. That would change a few dynamics. She asks him how long he was behind bars. Three years. She comments that she's built a home here and they've burnt it down over the night. He defends his actions but inevitably he shows the devil right to her doorstep. 
But the devil doesn't look for innocent people, does he? Dovey receives a message from Ray that confirms that the child's safe. He says they should meet in a church. Dovey opts to go with the things Ray is after. So Ray doesn't mistakenly shine. A fatal ray of sunlight at Eve if she goes for the exchange. Sit down and listen to the story. Ray was managing a bowling alley when he met Eve's so-called mom who wasn't doing so well after her husband passed. She started seeing Ray who would come over to Eve's mom's shop at the state park where this big civil war battle had been fought. Ray picked interest in the coins and weapons on display above the battle diorama. He saw an opportunity. He lifted the loot. Dovey says, but Eve corrected him saying they lifted the loot. Dovey wraps up the story saying she gave him up and ran, hanging out to dry like the sands in the desert. Dovey calls his dad and informs him about the big problem he's gotten his hands into. Pops just urges him to be careful and get his skinny butt back to the house before Bonnie B comes poking around again. Next thing, he's going into a church that's rounding up one of my favorite hymns. God in three persons, blessed trinity. The pastor tells them to sit and, like the devil barging dramatically, Dovey opens the door and pulls everyone's attention to himself. He locates Ray and sits behind him. After a few squabbles, allegations here and there, Ray bursts into laughter that interrupts the preacher. Embarrassed, he asks everyone to get on their feet and sing the next hymn. Ray takes a hymn book and passes it on to Dovey. Dovey opens up the hymn book and finds another shocking reveal. The whole story about Ray meeting Eve's mother was a lie. These two lying leeches were lovers. Dovey drops the location for the exchange and strides out of the church. Dovey encounters Bonnie B. He tries to run, but is tackled to the ground, cuffed, and stood back up. Eve watches as he is being dragged away. Dovey explains everything to Bonnie B. in the interrogation room. She informs him that all the calls between him and Ray were recorded. Right now they don't see him as a threat, but as someone who was a caring friend. Later that evening, at the break of dusk, Ray takes the child to the boat where Eve is waiting in patience and fear. The child rushes to her mother at the first sight of her. Eve tells the girl that she and Ray have to go talk about group up stuff outside. The first comment Ray makes is that she renamed the boat. Eve doesn't want to beat around the bush, because if he gets caught, she gets caught with him too. Her part of the loot she used for her daughter ignites his anger as she says that he's putting them in a bad place with his presence. He ninja punches her in the nose, and she falls on her knees bleeding from her nose. She sends her daughter back in saying she'll be in soon. Ray and Eve sit at the front of the boat, and Ray is blabbering about how much time and life prison takes out of you. Dovey is still in the interrogation room when an officer calls on Bonnie B, and she tells him to get his story straight before she uses the door. Eve is cleaning up herself in the bathroom of the boat. She uses this opportunity to text one letter, T, to Dovey. Ray opens the door and takes the phone out of her hand. They all exit the boat. Dovey fills the cops in on what's going on. Bonnie B is driving when he asks who tipped them that he'd be at the church. She says it was unspecified. Dovey concludes that with all the information he has given them, they still don't find him. They stop for Dovey to pee. While peeing he sees a notice on the wall, seeing the letter T, and he realizes what Eve sent to him. It was the unknown object which had by now been identified as a shipwreck from old times. Dovey comes out and sets to run. Bonnie asks him not to leave and threatens to shoot him, but he still runs off anyway. Ray is trying to pull up the shipwreck for possible scraps. Eve sees an opportunity and pushes him off the boat. She couldn't loosen a rope in time. Ray climbs aboard and holds her daughter high. With a rope down in the depths, someone will have to dive in for it. Ray tells Eve to jump in for it. She tries to use her woman's charms to woo him. For a second there, it looks like it worked so she blends in for a kiss. While kissing him she notices Dovey at the back of the boat, trying to sneak up on Ray. Dovey attacks Ray in a bit of an exchange of punches. Eve runs in and takes one of the ancient relics that was a knife and stabs Ray. Ray turns around and tries to gun Eve down, but Dovey intervenes. Dovey and Ray are now in the depths of the water. Dovey with his dolphin lungs tries to keep Ray in the water till he runs out of air. In a bid to do that, he hugs Ray in the water, stabbing himself slightly. He emerges from the depths and tells her to sail away. While he swims to the cops, buying them time to escape, he finishes another sentence. The usual $27 check and the bid that Eve left for him in goodwill to find her. His parole officer was still Bonnie B. She informs him that the boat was found around Cumberland Island, and she gives him her blessings knowing fully well that this bird is gonna fly straight to where his ladybird is nested. The movie ends as Dovey and Pops sail away for the family business.